Hello everybody, welcome to the OC show. My name is uh, Tim, also known as uh, Xiao, and here is Peter today, also known as Nasman. How's it going? All good. Yeah, so welcome to the OC show live Q&A, your first time. How does it feel? It feels very exciting, yeah. I would say. It also <laughs> feels very early. Yeah, so you had to wake up a little bit early. Not as early as me, because I had to set it up, because uh, this week Truthman is not here. He's attending a wedding in France. So uh, I spoke to him before, he was really tired, so... Um, Thanks, Truffman, for being there before to have me set it up, and I hope that today everything is going to work out fine, actually, hopefully, hopefully. And actually, we do have a, a guest with us today on the show. Uh, his name is uh, probably known to you because his name is actually Dennis Garcia. Hi, Dennis. How is it going? Pretty good. Thanks for having me back. Oh, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Um, so today we have a few topics to discuss, actually. Um among which uh, we have as a first topic let me click 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 quickly and show you the topic list uh, so actually the world tour after movie went out a few days ago and uh, so if you guys haven't seen it yet you should actually go check it out on the overclocking tv uh, youtube channel it's, um, just go there or you can actually just search it in there uh, second topic we're going to talk about is uh, Paul on next about about uh, discontinuing some uh, obsolete 2d benchmarks uh, nothing too scary here, it's just uh, pretty much uh, informing you guys that some benchmark will be removed, but no no panic. Uh, good news, FutureMark provides open keys, so that's also one of the trending topics of the last week, so I guess a lot of people have been pretty happy about that because it uh, kind of like makes things a lot easier for people that didn't have yet a key, and um, hopefully that's going to make also, I guess, FutureMark's life easier as well to not receive so many private messages on their forums or emails for support. And these uh, new Radeon R9 Fury X, um, Peter, you've uh, gone through all the news about this, so I guess you would be the one mainly taking a position on this. <laughs> I've, I've read through the new uh, AMD uh, Radeon 300 series offerings and then the Fury cards. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. So, yeah, we're going to talk about that. And, of course, as a last topic for the day, we're going to talk about the future of the HWBOT World Tour. So, see what, what's going to be there next year. Um, so, let me put you uh, back into the shot or, or to your friend. I mean, for some reason, you're all small, but that's not really a big deal, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so the, um, like we were mentioning, the, the World Tour is out, so you guys can actually check it out. It's on YouTube, there's not much to say about this, but let's talk to, uh, right away about our second topic of the day, which is actually the, the poll we were having on HGI Bot, and you started this poll, Peter, and for this time there's no drama about it, it's actually pretty plain simple. Uh, yeah, so the whole discussion is about a couple of beta benchmarks we have on HGI Bot, which are... Uh, obsolete in terms of either the, the code is not optimized to be used as a competitive benchmark yeah. or no one is using it properly or no one is using it uh, end of sentence. Okay. So what we did is um, uh, our, our staff actually, Geneven and Christian A, they looked at all the, the beta benchmarks, sort of the benchmarks. When a benchmark is, a, is beta, it means that um, it's not fully um, part of the HWBOT suite yet. Yeah. If, if it gets promoted from beta to final, then there's no points yet, but it's it's it, you can use the benchmark potentially in the future for points. Anyway, the beta benchmarks are sort of uh, we use it for testing to see if a new benchmark, if we're able to use it in our competitions mm -hmm. or if it's usable for for competitive overclocking. Yeah. Um, so they 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 went through all the beta benchmark and they identified five of them which are which should meet, should be canned according to the staff. So we put out a poll to see what the what the community yeah. thinks about this. So I put up the poll quickly here on the on the screen. So basically you go to hsibot.org and on the right hand side in the sidebar you have here the different benchmarks. So yeah, processing power 3D PM dash MT slash ST. I have no idea about this one. Frybench, this one we heard a little bit about it, but discarded. Hyperpy, multi-threaded pi, and none. So basically uh, if um, none is selected, then I guess there's still four of them that will go out, right? Because <laughs> <Are laughs> you, uh, you say pick five, right? So you're going to remove five no matter what. Uh, no, that's actually, that's sort <laughs> of a translation. Okay. It's a loss in translation. So you can pick any of any of the five or yeah. the option none, depending on which you want to go. And if you, if you actually look at the results, I think... Um, Let's vote for none then, just so to, to stay... Uh, 
I'm not logged in. Okay, well, I can use the results. <laughs> right. So it's a uh, about one uh, one in five votes goes to each of the benchmarks, which is essentially Basically pretty much everyone says. <laughs> <laughs> so they pick five, right? They pick the first the first five, pretty much. Okay, so, so what happened to a benchmark that will be archived? Um, so the rankings will be removed. There will be no rankings for it anymore. What happens to the submissions we've done for it? The submissions stay in the database, and you'll okay. find them in your, in your profile as well. It's just that you'll not get any ranks for it. That means no cups and no points. Okay. So you were talking about the process of selecting benchmark, and I think that's pretty interesting. Um, I was... Um, could you explain? So you said, uh, for example, you first the beta, the benchmark comes as a beta into the into the system. And the administrator, the moderators, they check to see how this goes. What's the next step after that? Like for instance, there's there's actually no fixed procedure for how to promote benchmarks from beta to um, to final. How it usually works is uh, either we find a new benchmark or the community says, hey, maybe we should try this benchmark. We add it as a beta, mm -hmm. and then we host a competition for it. Just an initial competition to see if there's uh, some initial bugs with the with the application. If there are bugs, then either we go instantly like, no, we cannot we cannot use this, or we go to the benchmark developer and ask them, hey, can you maybe optimize it or fix these issues? Um, established benchmarks like 3D Mark would always go to final almost instantly because we yeah. know that those benchmarks are secure. Yeah, it's pretty solid usually, yeah. so no issues. And when a benchmark is promoted to final, uh, usually there is no points. There might be hardware points, and mm -hmm. then depending on the popularity, it would actually go to to global points or not. Okay. Well, that's that's. You can you can find all the information if you go if you just click on benchmarks in the navigation menu. Yep. And then you have a massive list. So the all uh, those are all the green lighted benchmarks. Well, much. we have a, you have a section called beta, and under the beta section, obviously, there would be the beta benchmarks. Yeah. Okay. So the beta benchmarks, you have to go where? You can see it right there. Ooh, right there. Right there. Exactly. <coughs> all right. Cool. Yeah. I noticed those ones here. <laughs> okay. So um, talking about benchmarks. So actually, um, future mark. Uh, so Christian Ney, actually, which is the head moderator at HDIBot, um talked with uh, Future Mark about uh, this is a, which is something which is kind of a big issue for the guys that wanted to submit to all the benchmarks but that couldn't get a key anymore. So usually what you have to do is pretty much find a moderator that could hook you up with someone at Future Mark, which could then, in the end, hook you up with a key so you could actually submit the benchmarks properly, get the validation links and all that. So um, what is the solution to this? So Christian Ney reached out to FutureMark, and um, well, you, as you said, bef as you said before, usually the process would be if it's old and legacy and EOL and discontinued benchmarks, yep. people would ask FutureMark for a key, and they would just give it to their community manager. Manager Passy would usually give the key so you can bench. Um, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of manual labor. So what they did is together with Christian. Um, mm -hmm. They, they came up with a couple of open keys that anyone can use to submit to their account. Okay, so that key is, uh, so everyone has the same key in the end. Is that, you can, is yeah, that you a can problem? Find, or? No, you can find the keys and you just use your own login. It's, a, it's sort of a, it's a generic key that you would, that you can just use to unlock your software. Okay. Usually, the, so when you unlock the software, even if you have a non-official key, it would, it would still work. The only problem is when you try to upload it to your FutureMark profile, it would actually say, hey, you're using an illegal, illegal key, and it would flag the, uh, it wouldn't even pass the submission, and it would oh, probably okay. flag your account. So what you have now is you have a key that you can use, and it'll, be able, uh, it'll allow, allow you to submit to your, to your okay. FutureMark profile. Yeah, Dennis, do you, do you have um, do you have old mm. versions of uh, FutureMark, for instance? Oh yeah, I have um, I have copies of all of them, all the way back to was it three D Mark ninety nine or whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, in terms of like legitimate keys, so that yeah, I could submit, I have mail for um, you. I only have like three. Oh, okay, yeah. There's someone talking to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was Dennis has mail. <laughs> that's that's something we know for sure now. So, 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 so yeah, um, as a reviewer, I get keys from FutureMark so that I can use their benchmarks in my um, use. But um, I've had to go out and buy like 3D Mark 03 so I could compete in MOA, for instance. Yeah. So. Well, the good thing, though, those key didn't used to be that expensive, but it's a good thing, I guess, now that uh, people can have it freely available. And I'm not sure how much the price is actually for. Is it 15 US dollars on Steam? 
Uh, they had a flash sale last uh, weekend, but that was for the only the new versions, yeah. For like mm-hmm. Skydiver. Okay. But that was, uh, I think at discount, it was like six ninety nine or seven ninety nine something okay. like this. Yeah, so you can find them on Steam, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it makes it easier to reinstall every time if you want to run Steam and other things. But that's only the modern ones. Um, yeah. They don't go back too far, so. Yeah. I, I suppose all the ones before 3 Mark 11 are not up on Steam. I'm not even sure if 3 Mark 11 is up no, on Steam. No, I'm not even sure. Well, we could uh, we could look that up, actually. I'm not sure. I don't have Steam installed on my notebook. so I We used to have it here on the machine here, but we could do a quick check, but if it doesn't break anything. <laughs> you, you have I, it back on still? I can look. Oh, okay. Uh, Dennis is going to check that. Dennis, look it up. So which version do you prefer from the old legacy versions? Which version do I prefer? Well, I, th- <laughs> I think the, the competitive benchmarking sort of started with 3 Mark 2000 and then yeah. just exploded with 3 Mark 2001. Okay. So I suppose like a lot of a lot of old school overclockers have very fond memories of 3D Mark 01. Yeah, I like 3D Mark 01. 3D Mark 06 was alright as well, actually. 3D Mark 06 was essentially 3D Mark 05 plus two CPU tests added yeah. to it and a bit beefed up <laughs> graphics. It was cool back then. Back then. <laughs> all right. So on Steam right now, you yeah. can get 3D Mark. You can get 3D Mark 11. You can get 3D Mark Vantage and PC Mark 8. They actually put up Vantage as well. Yeah, they, really they have see. Vantage. Well, they have everything in their, their 3D Mark suite anyway. Like, there's no point of having Vantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can download them all from the, so the main software anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, that's... I mean, it, it makes sense the to depot. have... Oh, Maybe sorry, for no. SEO purposes. No idea. Yeah. Well, you have the demo on Steam that you can download for free. That's the one that you can get from Future Mark. Mm. Uh, but you can also buy... 3D Mark, 3D Mark 11, 3D Mark Vantage, and PC Mark 8. So what's the price 3D. For, uh, for 3D Mark? For 3D Mark is $25 US. dollars okay. Yeah. I thought it was 15 for some reason. Yeah. yeah. Um, 3D Mark 11 is $20, and Vantage is 10 Oh, yeah, so if there's a Steam sale, then it's pretty much free. <laughs> I mean, yeah, pretty- let's be honest. But the it's people, all the people who are... Benching competitively, or the people who are running the three marks, they're, they're also the same people who buy five hundred dollar graphics yeah. cards and yeah, five hundred dollar CPUs. So, so you should be able to find a few bucks. Twenty five, <laughs> twenty five US dollars is a is a, yeah. not a very large amount. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the big, the big <laughs> problem with the with the with the EOL benchmarks is that they're not supported officially by Futuremark anymore. So you could actually not buy any license. Yeah, you cannot find them on their shop. You, you can't. Anything. You you can just not buy the license. So that was a problem for people who wanted to both have them in their in their Futuremark profile still and get the verification files to sort of uh, serve as a proof for their for their benchmark scores. Yeah. But it was just not possible. True. So those keys, Peter. Where can we find them? They are um, in the forum, and they can also be found on the front page. Oh, yeah, they're going to be faster to find, probably. Go to front page, go down, because I saw some guys on the chat asking for it. Yep. Scroll, scroll, scroll. scroll. There, there you go. go. We have that matrix picture kind of copy. And then and um, there you go. There's and the forum right there. Click, the click. There you have all the keys. So this is public information. You guys can screenshot it, copy it, use it anything you want. So it's pretty cool actually. I guess it's a good sign. And there was someone asking uh three Marco six was that the one with the the Steam ship? Uh, so, so the so Steam ship one, right? was both in 3D Mark 05 and yeah. 06. 06 it, it looks, looks better in 06. Well, if you don't turn on yeah. the LOD, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because most of the guys, uh, most of the other clockers turn it on, then it lo- everything looks like <laughs> like crap. <laughs> it lo- it kind of loses of its uh, yeah, of its uh, of its style. So this image, for instance, from which one is that? That one is also from 3 Mark 06 and 3 Mark 05. It's the first uh, game test GT1. I think it's called Return to Polygon mm. or something along those lines. Oh, yeah, they start in some kind of elevator and then they have a... Yeah, and then there's a massive uh, massive firefight and then they just con- they, they sort of cross the hangar yeah. to go to uh, the next level. Makes me think yeah, of uh, uh, the Star Wars, what is it, like uh, the, the drone thing, like uh, they have some game, oh, I forgot, Republic something. Well, you know, Star Wars, and that, that great, I think. Uh, yeah, so PC Marco 2 as well, PC Marco 4, and PC Marco 5. Dennis, are you a big fan of PC Marco 5, like everyone should be? Uh, no. no. No? No? It's not, it's not your, your love affair? 
PC Mark 05? I, I want to say that I've run PC Mark 05 once in my entire life. And it wasn't for a score. I was just like, what the heck is this? And then, no, didn't do it. Yeah, those PC, uh, those PC, I think if, if you're a fan of PC Mark, it's a, you're a very special kind of overclock, I would say. Not everyone yeah. gets hooked up on PC Mark. Well, the thing with PC Mark, at least from me looking, you know, from the outside looking in, it's um, it's a storage subsystem and a system subsystem, well, mm -hmm. subsystems there, um, sort of benchmark. And there's a limit for how fast the uh, hard drive can be, which yeah. is to keep you from running, um, you know, like RAM disks and stuff like that. So that arbitrary limit kind of, you know, took away a little bit of the fun. Of that picture. It's it's a pretty funny story how that arbitrary limit came into place because um, future, to to prevent uh, uh, cheaters from uploading ridiculous scores on the FutureMark orb, FutureMark would always have an artificial limit to any of the benchmark caps. So back but in the back in the old days when you were running 3 to Mark uh, 01 or 3 to Mark 03, there would be cases where let's say you're the first one to go over 25,000 points and your score wasn't supported by the future mark orb they had to like up that Someone artificial limit. Someone had to check if it was actually valid behind the scenes. Well it was just an artificial limit to prevent people who post ridiculous scores to show up in the Hall mm. of Fames and when PC Mark 05, um, when the first RAM disk software started to come up, they had this exact same issue. So the way to identify RAM disks back in the day was to look at the HDD startup, uh, XP startup subtests and cap it to 220 megabytes per second, <laughs> which was pretty funny because... <laughs> if you think about SSDs nowadays, that would be ridiculous. Well, that is the problem. <laughs> it is ridiculous. The SSDs nowadays are fast enough to go past that 220 megabytes per second oh, yeah, limitation. Sure. And I suppose... In hindsight, you could actually say that it was sort of uh, it was a bit um, short-sighted to disallow RAM disks because obviously a RAM disk is faster for this specific for this specific test. So, yeah. should you disallow it? Yes, no. That's that's uh, something yeah. that is up for debate. That was up for debate a long time ago. And yeah. also, I guess uh, back in those early days of the internet, there was a lot more possible hacks through the submission systems. Maybe or I don't know actually how how security was back then, but. I guess now there's more, there's more algorithms probably behind the scene calculating maybe poss possibilities of high scores. Uh, FutureMark has this um, service they run in the background called uh, System Info, and mm -hmm. using the System Info, they have all these checks in place of what kind of hardware are you using, what hardware are you using, if the timers are still in sync, what kind of um, options you have enabled and disabled in the registry. So they do a lot more checks and yeah. obviously system in info will eat some some of the system resources. But if it eats it up for everybody then? Yeah, right. I suppose so. I, I suppose back in the day, 10 years ago, the, yeah. the, if, if you would have the same eating up of the system resources, it would actually affect the benchmark result. Whereas yeah. nowadays... It's probably insignificant. Yeah. It's like 0.1% of a core or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You want to well, go ahead? Oh, I was going to say, especially with the new systems that are multi-core and these benchmarks that are only might support two cores, you can just set the affinity to system info to some core that's not being used. Yeah. Or True. not being used heavily. Yeah. 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 So is there some, uh, some so what, what kind of competitions, for example, are the HWBOT or OC Esports, can people use for those legacy benchmarks? Oh, it really depends. Like, there's no specific competition yeah. that that's with these benchmarks, but they do return. And as Dennis said, they would be used in competitions like MOE because not because the, the benchmarks are relevant to the games you're using, but because they're they're well suited for competitive overclocking. Mm -hmm. Like you, you mentioned, three Mark O three before, and three Mark O three sort of evolved from a graphics de dependent benchmark to now more system dependent benchmark. So. If you're running single GPU on liquid nitrogen, you need to have a very fast CPU to go with it as well, yeah. and you need to optimize your your system uh, systems uh, settings as well. So these benchmarks all evolve into some kind of a there's there's a certain there's a certain bottleneck that they all impose, and they make them more or less interesting for competitive overclocking. It's very similar to, for example, um, three Mark O five where you have to actually go down to, okay, which operating system are you going to use for a certain yeah, graphics XP card? Or, yeah. Yeah. or Vista or... <laughs> Vista, oh my God. <laughs> Who is still using Vista? Raise your hand. No, <laughs> not me. 
probably used it for about three days and then that gave up. Vista had their direct direct X ten, right? So you Oh yeah, well, that, that didn't matter back then. There was <laughs> there was not that many games. If you wanted to run if you wanted to run Vantage, it did matter. Yeah. So some guys on the chat are asking, uh, where is Isai Simonet? And of course, Isai is sleeping. He's actually uh, back to Europe for some uh, attending a wedding of a friend. So that's why he's not here. And I replaced him by Peter. And I guess uh, he's supposedly enjoying himself. So he must be back on the next shows or eventually <laughs> other things. Um, and of course, we have with us uh, Dennis Garcia from Hardware Asylum. Always here. Thank you very much for being there. Thanks to everybody that is uh, tuning in tonight. Uh, you are quite a few. Uh, for you guys, your nicknames are not easy to pronounce. So I'm not going to go through the whole list. Uh, Chai Tom, Infused, DPT, uh, Lynch Chronic, Obscure Products, a very regular member. Rogan Moore, QTV, Sinzia, which is rehosting the stream. And a few more. Yep, and a few more. All right. So, anything else to add about those uh, nice benchmarks? Uh, thank you, Feature Mark. Yes, thank you, Feature <laughs> Mark. We're going to make good use of those legacy benchmarks, I'm sure. <laughs> Moving on to, uh, to the next topic, actually. Uh, this one, we're going to talk about AMD's uh, new graphics cards. And uh, there has been some kind of uh, drama around it for the last two weeks, I would say. Actually, since the review came out, because the launch was not so much about drama, but... What came after that was an unleashment of press against um, AMD. Yeah. Not about the Fury X, essentially, but around um, it. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the Fury X is... So AMD launched the Radeon 300 series graphics card, and the Fury X is sort of the... It's the most... It's the, the top, top of the line yeah. model. And That's the, their kind of Titan X, right? That's why they call it something X. Yeah, but it's competing with the 980 Ti, though. It's yeah. not really directly competing with the Titan X. The, the cool thing about the Titan X is that it uses the HBM, so it's the new memory that's actually on die. Yeah. Um, so um, inside the GPU, right? Well, it's on, on, the, CPU, on the GPU die, so okay. it's not inside the GPU. There's still four chips around the GPU core. But HBM memory is sort of the new thing, and that's what AMD is saying. You know, that's a new technology. We're first with this new technology. Um, their new Hawaii, uh, on the Fury X, you also have the new Hawaii core, yeah. which is the new architecture of AMD. And uh, the Hawaii core has, um, um, as its main ad advantage, a 4,096-bit yeah. um, uh, memory interface. So the HBM memory is running at 500 megahertz, which is significantly lower than everything else that's currently on the market. But because this massive memory uh, memory bus yeah. is actually the, the throughput is really really high, so it it can compete with the 980 Ti. Then you have all the other 300 series graphics cards, which, so the cheaper ones. Well, yeah, everything that's positioned below the Fury X. So I think it goes the 390 X is what 500 US dollars, 450. Yeah. Dennis, I don't know. <laughs> those those graphics cards are. Rebrands. Okay. AMD, AMD doesn't want anyone to call it rebrands, but that's what they basically are. So they are not the same chips than in the Fury X. No, definitely not. No, no, no. They they're using the chips that they've also used in the 200 series graphics cards, and uh, I think the uh, Radeon R7 370 is mm -hmm. actually using the Pitcairn core, which was also used on the Radeon HD 7950. So that's two years. That's, I think, 2000. The 7970, the first 7970 was launched at the very end of 2011. So, it's yeah, so it's kind of ridiculous, I guess. Well, I wouldn't say ridiculous. There's a, there's a bunch of features that are added to the card, but they, they offer no significant uh, performance gain. I mean, the, the, the power consumption goes down, obviously, and if the power consumption go, goes down, you can make uh, cards. Yeah, you can cooler, more silent, stuff like that. Um, also, the yields get better, so the clock frequencies can be bumped up every time a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it has to be said that the, the R300 series cards are very well, very well positioned uh, in a terms of uh, price performance yeah. category. So in each of the categories where the, where the 300 cards are competing, they offer a good value. They offer good value for what you're spending. It's just that... We've seen this technology before, and it's it's not really exciting. Yeah, and especially uh, if it's the same, don't try to to hide it, right? 
Um, this was mainly the point of the press. Like, I mean, there's no need to make so much fuss about it. You I can you can announce it as a rebranch or upgraded kind of thing. I think that the, the what the, the main problem with with AMD is that they overpromise and underdeliver. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone was expecting a lot from this new. Every, when AMD, AMD says things. we have something new, everyone's always exciting, uh, excited. Sorry. Which is which is really cool because they haven't really done that much in the past five years in terms of exciting new technology. They came up with stuff that wasn't delivering as anyone would expect it. So after five years of not really delivering, yeah. people still get excited about what they can come up with, and then it's sort of it's sort of underwhelming. It is the same goes with the Fury X. I mean, technology is really awesome. It's really cool to see something innovative, but then. At their E3 press conference, they, they promised the Fury X is great for overclocking because you have this 500-watt uh, cooling, yeah. uh, cooling unit, and they're only targeting 75 degrees on the, on the GPU because it's all-in-one water cooling. And then if you look at the reviews, um, for example, like the hard, hardware.info and PC Perspective, they got a boost of about 10%. So, it's, yeah, there's no gain. Well, <laughs> is, that, is that because of the, the new chips you were saying that are close to the core? Or? The, well, there's 100 megahertz on the GPU core and no overclocking on the HBM memory. So is that the HBM memory cannot be overclocked? Or is uh, that just on that specific design? I, I would assume everything can be overclocked. I assume that the, the driver hooks are not there yet, so yeah. or the BIOS hooks have have not been set in place yet. So it's just a matter of providing the providing the tools to the community to figure out yeah. how to do the overclocking. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you promise great overclocking and then it can be overclocked ten percent, that's just why. <laughs> <laughs> why? Yeah. Actually, uh, also I was thinking because the, those memory chips are close to the core, is that going to be an issue on the cold? Because usually memory gets too cold, and that's one of the main concerns. Right? Uh, well, we haven't seen any reports yet. There's a couple of people who've already been posting benchmark results on HWBot, but those are well, yeah, they're running 100 megahertz overstock on the GPU. That's that's basically it. Um, I've seen uh, Jaguar Review yeah. is looking into the voltage modifications for a card, uh, but they haven't figured it out yet. So we haven't seen anyone uh, post the voltage modification for the Fury X. And if you can't increase the voltage, then there's no point of actually putting uh, LM2 on the cards. Mm. Also, yeah. uh, you, you can have some cold issues with the cards, and then they can be resolved by, by a new BIOS, like an, an okay, LM2 yeah, BIOS yeah. or something like that. So even if you would have issues with on their cold right now, it doesn't specifically mean mm. that those are the issues related to the HBM memory, or even if they are related to the HBM memory, if they can't be resolved in the, in the near future. So right now, know, yeah. extreme overclocking the Fury X is still a question mark. Especially right now, it's all reference designs. Yeah. So I guess maybe once the vendors will have their hands on or like... Will they be allowed to do... Actually, Fury I don't know. Custom PCB? Then is it... I haven't heard anything about it. No? Not allowed? Yeah. The, the rumor is that the Fury X is not going to be so uh, given to the vendors to make custom PCBs. It's going to be a reference design just like the Titan X from... Uh, yeah, yeah. NVIDIA. Do you think that is because um, they just they want to do just like uh, NVIDIA, just own their own branded card, or is it because they don't have enough GPUs? Because the yields are apparently fairly low for uh, Fury X, the Hawaii GPUs. Well, there could be a couple of reasons for that. One, obviously it could be limited GPUs, right? Especially with the new um, package design with the chips around the core. But if you go back eight, 10 years, Everything out of ATI wasn't allowed. In, it was all a reference card. They were, they didn't allow you to do any special modifications to the board aside from adding a separate cooler or tweaking the BIOS a little bit. So they might be going back to that. Um, it helps them control costs. It helps them keep the costs down um, instead of like you know just wildly across the board. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also it's a brand new chip. They don't want anybody breaking it yet. So <laughs> it's that that is that is very. Very strange, at least from my point of view. If if companies are willing to do something magical with your product, especially if you don't have the fastest product in the market, especially why, if you don't have the time to make a better one, also like why wouldn't you just allow it? Why wouldn't you? Uh, AMD's always been weird about partners. Like I don't, I don't, I don't really understand. Yeah, well, at least what for, for Nvidia, are. usually it's pretty strict, but it does kind of make sense in the the general kind of view. yeah. And they even do, though Titan X would have been great with 
non-references. Well, if, if you look at the, the, the offerings for the GTX 980 Ti, that's pretty cool. I mean, a lot of the cards are really fast, out of the box, overclocked. Yeah. They have very nice designs. It's, it's cool to have some, something that doesn't look reference in your, in your case. And it's, it's nice for, for NVIDIA as well, because you have all, all, all their partners promoting the heck out of the, the, 980, the 980 Ti. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a checkdown I'm saying on the chat. It's not a rumor. It was confirmed. It's a reference only and tested chip, and HPM is in low stock. Yeah. So how about, how about the, the, the cheaper card? The, 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 the regular Fury? Yeah. Or is that not a thing? I thought it was going to be a, a regular well, Fury or in the a, shop. We didn't sell anything, right? or a Fury Pro or Fury. yeah, the 380. You mean no? Because no, I'm I not really sure. sure. <clears throat> if there would have been non-reference card, there would have been some kind of something from the vendors already, right? Because yeah, usually you, you would have <laughs> used the, the halo of the launch from AMD to also you know at least push some pictures or something. But here there was absolutely nothing. Nothing going on. I did nothing from ISIS, Gigabyte, MSI, nothing at all. Yeah, that's true. The the R9 Nano looks pretty cool though. Yeah. It's a really, really tiny one fan cooling solution. Yeah. And Obscure Probox says potential uh, potential limited edition competition only Fury X might happen, like the 780 Ti Lightning. Yeah. yeah that would be also <laughs> boring actually as well. There's no need for making limited editions. Just yeah. go ahead. Well, you might get a limited edition, like a Devil 13 card from Power Color, or you might get um, something from Sapphire. But um, they're all going to be reference cards, and the only thing special is going to be the cooler. Okay, so yeah. they might put the water cooler and put on a triple fan or something like that. And again, availability usually is kind of the issue for those cards. There's not that many out there. That's that's That would also be weird. Why why would partners then swap out the all-in-one for, for air cooling <laughs> when the main point of this Fury X is that, hey, guys, the one we've, is we've cool, water-cooled it so you have a lot of overclocking potential. Well, that is so weird. This plus actually <laughs> also silent side. Because usually that's the thing about graphics cards. Like if you have a big all-in-one, like a 120 or something, sound is a lot. Yeah, I don't... I, I, I'm just... That that would be weird to see a Fury X with a massive fan on that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine it's going to be that hot, to be honest. But, um, yeah, the, you know, because... Well, like right now... Megahertz extra, it's not going to be that hot. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to... You won't have that much headroom on there. Mm -hmm. And now you can put water coolers on... Um, you know, current NVIDIA chips and whatnot, but the the sound versus temperature versus overclockability of it, it's virtually the same between air and water. Yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, one time I did a, we did a video for, I think it was Arctic. They were doing those all-in-one water coolings for graphics cards. So, but uh, they were trying to support as many GPUs configuration as possible. So transforming the, the pain of the mounting completely, like, it was really, really hard to actually, because sometimes the cable had to pass at the top, sometimes they could only pass at the bottom, you know, depending where the different things were on the card, plus the different mounting holes, so your backplate was actually drilled from everywhere. So it was not really... How about... All in one is not easy on that. Has, has anyone read anything about the VRMs on the Fury X? Because if I remember correctly, the it's only the GPU that's get cooled, that gets cooled by the all-in-one, mm -hmm. so the VRM is not getting cooled. Yeah. So from other cards, you know that the VRM can get pretty hot, especially inside a case. Yeah. So what did they do to prevent any well, any issues there? Obscure product says VRM needs some cooling. Runs at 100 C right now, so that's pretty yeah. damn hot. So there's probably nothing on it. Not even a heat spreader. Well, if there's no fan, it's almost. See, that is that is the problem with that's the problem with AMD. It's like that. It's they have a great idea and then. They sort of cut corners in the yeah. implementation of it because obviously anyone anyone who does VJ testing at home, anyone who's do, who's doing overclocking a VJ at home will have a fan on the VRM because they know yeah. once you're trying to 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 overclock it, that's where you're going to have the heat is going to be. Yeah. yeah. So why don't you design an all-in-one cooler that also yeah. cools the VRM? I mean, I mean, I mean seriously, that come makes on. Me think, you you know? have a you have a reference design anyway. Yeah. Like you can control every every aspect of it. Actually, on Computex, there was this company called uh, Cryorig. Um, they had an interesting booth, like very nice uh, design and stuff. But apart from this, they had a, 
They were showing off, let's see if we can find it on the site, some all-in-one cooler. Actually, their, their website is not that great. Uh, they had an all-in-one cooler, which had the, um, so the regular water block, for, it was for CPU, but it had a fan on the side. So if you mount it, like for example, on the, on the bench table, you still had a small fan, like blowing air on the, on the, on the VRMs and the faces. I'm trying to find it, but maybe it cost more. Yeah, they don't have it. If I'm not mistaken, Corsair has some brackets for their all at once. Yeah, that you can mount the fan do, as well. I think they do actually, they cool the VRMs. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about yeah. that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, water uh, plus fan. A series cool. Maybe that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. So it has some kind of fan on top. And the same, you can, I think, unclip it or anything like this. But this is pretty good. This is what you should have on your graphics card, ideally. Something similar. I mean, sure, yeah. And oh, after, that's all marketing I mean, stuff. Okay, if you look at NVIDIA, for example, they have the zero cool technology, which yeah. essentially disables the fan in, uh, in idle mode when it's not overheating. So, okay, even if you cannot make a full design that cools... The, the VRM actively have have this feature where you have a fan that is in in, in that will disable itself. It's in idle, so yeah. you still have zero these about. I mean, this is a very very simple solution to your VRM issue, right? Yeah. Maybe, right. maybe I'm just thinking of it. It's, it's maybe I'm just. You know, <laughs> I don't see all the problems with it, but it seems so weird. Yeah. Well, I guess like there's nothing we can do <laughs> besides just wait to see what's gonna happen. Um, so did I do wonder what the Fury X X2 with the two GPUs are, is going to look like and how it's going to perform. Well, they're for sure going to add some cooling on. Because the main advantage of having the having the, the the memory chips on the GPU die is the fact that you you save so much space because you don't need to have the memory chips all around the PCB anymore. So I was I would assume that you can make a very compact dual GPU graphics card. Yeah. You could. I'm I'm waiting for the eight-way AMD Fury X. That'd be four cards with two chips on each card. I think that would be pretty damn sweet. Nice toaster. And driver issues. <laughs> <laughs> AMD overdrive. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, like, how many games are actually going to scale up to AGPUs as well? None, eh, none for the moment. That's not, that's not terribly... A few flight simulator. I mean... I don't think it's that important. It's more of an enthusiast thing, you know, showing off what you can do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, true. I mean, that was right now, you know, right now even four GPUs doesn't scale well in games. Yeah, you know, two is the sweet spot. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. From a technology point of view, it would be it would be pretty interesting to see what, even if it's just synthetic benchmarks. Oh yeah, yeah. even just a card for fun, even if they end up not releasing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it also worked well for um, was it the like mining and stuff like that, you know, someone, password. Someone should figure out how much GPUs you can put on one PCB if you think of the biggest PCB that someone has already manufactured. Can you put on three? Do you save that much space that you can put on three? We can put four CPUs on motherboards. I don't see why you would not put four GPUs. Right? Well, it's just, it's a form factor. Size, right? Yeah, well, yeah. You need you to know, make it pretty big. I think at that point you don't care about standards anymore anyway. So. If your graphics card is larger than AM, your uh, Sorry, not, not an AMD. Asus made a, a triple GPU once. Yeah, how did that went? I think it was the, was it the 5850? Oh, it's a very obscure card. It's like, I saw one pass by on the HW forums like a couple of months ago. It's the, it's the only triple GPU card, I think. But it must be long, really long. <sighs> no, I, I, I think it was maybe two PCBs or something. I don't know, I can't remember. It's... I can't remember the name even. Mm. <laughs> yeah, Secure Paradox is uh, bringing up the Voodoo 6000, yeah. which was the original quad GPU card. That was pretty darn awesome. They only made like five of them, but... That's way back, right? Oh, oh that's... Okay, so I found it. I, I found it. It's the, it's called uh, the Aces Trinity. Trinity. Trinity, yes. My Google is in Chinese for There you go. Reason. First picture. Okay. Yeah. There's no larger picture. Oh, so it's as large as it. Oh, it's a, sorry, thirty-eight fifty, and they use uh, the mobile <laughs> versions with MXM slots on their graphics card. <laughs> That's pretty cool, actually. 
That was at that point when uh, at that point our age level rankings were still uh, based on graphic cards, not graphic cores, and that was essentially the fastest graphics card in the world at that point. Yeah, it yeah. was never released, though. It was just a proof of concept. Well, you could uh, you could very well imagine people farming or rendering, or that would be the use case anyway. Well, I'm sure you could use it in games too, but. I don't know. There's there's plenty of stuff to to look into. For example, let's say you could you, let's say you could enable and disable <laughs> GPUs on the fly, and then you would use mobile versions which have a lower TDP yeah. to save more more power. I don't know. Yeah, it's actually funny <laughs> to read the quote here, <laughs> talking about 37 uh, FPS at 1280. <laughs> 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 I took 1024. It's actually uh, yeah, back in the old days. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also back in the old days um, when NVIDIA first started doing SLI, yeah. you couldn't run um, 2D and SLI at the same time, so you had to put a second card in there to get your 2D to work correctly. Mm -hmm. And I had suggested to them, well, why don't you just put a 2D chip on the card itself, and then you can SLI the 3D parts, and then when you don't need SLI, you disable and run the, the lower, um, you know, lower power chip. And they wrote back and said, well, we just updated our drivers to allow 2D to work in SLI, so we don't need that. <laughs> like, okay. It works. Works as well. So, yeah, yeah so um, now that the uh, world tour is over, how, uh, how are you going to plan next year? Well, that's, uh, that's the, big, uh, the big question, right? So the, the world tour uh, this year had three stops. Uh, basically, uh, we, had a, so we had a stop in Europe, a stop in North America. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will send you. <laughs> yeah, just just wait. I will reply you on the other Skype later on. <laughs> okay, what, so what there's some people talking to me. Um, anyway, so yeah, I was, um, I was saying, um, so we had three stops, one in North America, one, in, um, one in, the, in Europe, and one in Asia. And we were thinking of maybe adding some later this year, but we actually ended up saying, well, no, this is the end of the world tour at the Asian stop. And uh, that's about it. Like this, we have approximately six months to think about what's next, not to rush into the, the next season. So uh, yeah, what, what, what is going to be next, Peter, after all this? Um, what's yeah. the so, you master know, plan? This was the, fir <laughs> the first season or the first uh, year of the World Tour. Um, yeah. It was very good to learn how the organization of, of events uh, works, how to do the workshops, how to get people interested in it which in the end turned turned out to be no problem whatsoever as we saw in friends it was a uh, i think we had a hundred people in two days joining in mm -hmm. the um joining in the, the amateur workshop yeah so that's pretty cool um and then the one in computex was uh, was uh, pretty big as well with i think 24 extreme overclockers for the entire weekend yeah we didn't have the workshop at the at the computex event because it was more of a closed venue so it was sort of a different setup um for next year, more locations and perhaps even more focus on the workshops because yeah. that, that's actually really cool. You get a lot of very positive feedback from people who maybe they've heard about overclocking or maybe not even heard about overclocking, but when you show them, you can gain 40% in performance just... But in 30 minutes. Yeah, much. not even 30 minutes. Yeah. In, 10, in, in five minutes, you, do, you, you boot in, you overclock, you reboot and you get forty percent more performance. People almost are like, oh. no reboot necessary. I know a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people just said, "What? Hold on, it's it's that it's, easy? That's it? That's it? Like, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem." I guess most people see the pictures of guys modding their the card and some crazy stuff, and they must think, "Yeah, everything overclocking is like this." Actually, so I'm not gonna try it. It's I don't, don't want to solder on my card. Or anything. It's too difficult and. Yeah. So yeah, so that's that's gonna be the the main focus then going back to yeah. the so next year the the initial plan right now is to have two events in North America yeah uh, two in Europe and then two in Asia so a double that what we did uh, this year yeah so if you guys on the chat are actually willing to participate to one let us know where you would like to have it of course what we are looking for is events with already a crowd there. Because I mean, there's no need to. There's no point of doing an amateur workshop if there's nobody at the event mm -hmm. to begin with. Yeah, correct. So the idea is to have a, something like a LAN party, or it could be like a gaming convention as well, I suppose. But it will be a little bit maybe more noisy. The the, the LAN party is usually uh, more into the to the right area of field of 
the events we're looking for. Yeah, I suppose so. It's, it's, you, you need to have a location where people can take out an hour of their time to yeah. get to learn something about overclocking. Yeah. So if you do it on, let's say, a big convention like, like uh, Computex, people don't have an hour to True. pass Already by. They have, the they have about to see five, so. five to ten minutes and then they yeah. move on to the next booth or anything like that. Or so the booth base pass by. Th those those, are, those are very difficult, difficult locations. I don't, I'm not saying it's impossible, but you need to have a very good format, a very attractive format to do. Maybe br even briefer than that. Oh, you cannot hold the amateur competition then. Yeah. That, that's also what's... Well, there is an inherent, an inherent amount of time you need to explain overclocking and actually do overclocking. It's not like a game. Yeah. Like, it's not like you would have, a, uh, for example, a track mania competition where each of the tracks lasts like five minutes. Yeah. And you have about ten tries within those five minutes. It's overclocking, so you need to reboot, boot, solve your problems, um, reboot again, try again, yeah. until you get a score that's, that's satisfied. I, I would say half an hour was was enough at the in the in the amateur workshop in France yeah. for all the guys to sort for of groups reach, of five or something. Yeah, to reach their maximum on on a given system. Yeah. Yeah, I guess after after that anyway you need you need more training so you can mm -hmm. know how to fiddle with the memory. Like some guys did and in the end they had not the knowledge and it ended up being more problems than anything else. Yeah, f in so in the amateur yeah. workshop if someone knows how to enable XMP in the BIOS yeah. They go into the BIOS, enable XMP, then go to the Windows, and then they'll have a they'll have an advantage over the competition to begin with. Yeah. But you need that kind of information before you can you, before you can push higher. It doesn't matter how much time you have if you don't know how to enable XMP, yeah. you're not gonna have that performance. Plus, problem. imagine XMP has some kind of issue and doesn't work on that motherboard or with this kit of memory. Then you're like, okay, so now you use all your cards. <laughs> so what's <laughs> coming on that? Or it works on this one, but the system you have for the competition is not the same, and then it doesn't work. It doesn't mean you can. Uh, go further on so it's like yeah not that easy uh, so um, you Dennis you were suggesting PAX right yeah uh, PAX is already a well established gaming um, convention yeah they, they have uh, basically workshops where you get up and talk in front of an entire crowd of, of folks so you know if you could uh, do your workshop in a presentation form and then you can invite people from the crowd up to go and do it themselves, then uh, you know that would be a good venue that's well established, and it's in Australia. It's on the east coast of the U.S. It's on the west coast of the U.S. So, and every time they have a small LAN party uh, attached to it, right? So, you, I mean, like if some guys want to come by in the evening to train a bit more, practice, they would have the time to do the, to do so, right? Yep. Yeah. The the only thing with PAX is it's um, really gamer focused, so you'll have to talk with them to make sure that you could actually do that. Yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, if you really wanted to piggyback onto a convention, that's probably the one to do. Yeah. Yeah, PAX, was, uh, PAX is definitely one of the interesting ones, especially in the, in the U.S. Because last year we did the North America one in, uh, in Montreal. So it was at the biggest land party of Canada, the LAN ETS, the one Peter's wearing the T-shirt off, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, yeah, the, the thing is with this one, it's good, but there's not... There's not many people from the actual United States that come to that land party at all. So if you would like to, yeah. to cater to, to the guys in the U.S., we would have to go to the U.S. and probably even do two, one on the east and one on the west, I guess. I don't know yeah. how much or how, how open Americans are to travel inside the country to go to events like this. <laughs> your, your, your laugh kind of already <laughs> answered <No. that> question. <laughs> um, well, yeah, the travel within the states within the U.S., it's kind of like, you know, going from France to Germany, right? Um, the people on the, well, okay, well, they, the reason they have PAX East is to cater to the people on the East Coast. And you'll get people going down uh, into Massachusetts, which is, you know, the Boston area, yeah. from New York, Vermont, you know, within a couple of states, they'll be driving in to attend that convention. And the same with uh, PAX Prime, which is in Seattle, Washington. You get people from California, Idaho, where I'm from, um, I know of at least like 10 people that I've worked with that go to PAX Prime every year. Um, Montana, and you also get some people from Vancouver coming down from Canada to go and attend that event. So it's not wide stretched. I mean, you're not going to get very few people from the Dakotas going to either one of the PAXs, but that's yeah. kind of in the middle of the country. So Only some of the hardcore guys that, that really want to do, go do them all or something like this, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and the other thing, this is uh, kind of funny. The when the tickets go on sale, 
they usually sell out in about two hours. Yeah. So it's uh, even if I wanted to go, sometimes I'm not fast enough to go there and say, okay, I want a Sunday ticket. Oh, sold out. Crap. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Oh, actually, yeah. not, not interesting. Actually, that's impressive. That's the word I was looking yeah. for. Yeah, it's yeah. really impressive. It's, uh, it's mm -hmm. going to be probably a problem with our fellow overclockers that usually take a little bit more time to decide if they want to go somewhere. Like for events well, and things like that, I guess. But you're going after the amateurs. You're not going yeah, after yeah, these. Yeah. I mean, but if we combine it, for example, with some small bench body or something like this. That's the, that was the original idea of the World Tour, you know? It's, um, yeah. we, all the extreme overclockers, whenever they attend MOA or any session that they organize themselves, everyone's always full of, hey, I really enjoy hanging out with other extreme overclockers. And it, it makes sense because you're sharing your yeah. passion with people who are as passionate about what you do. Um, so those, those extreme OC events, it's very hard to, to find um, appropriate budgets to host them. Even if you even if you paid from your own pocket, you would have events that cost two hundred and fifty dollars per, per person. person yeah, if sure. you want to cover the venue, if you want to cover some food, if you want to cover where you're sleeping and if the you want to cover all the into. Yeah. So those are very costly events and a lot of vendors are just not like not willing to pay that amount of money for a simple extreme OC event. Yeah. So the idea is that we combine our amateur workshop with the extreme overclocking gathering. So we can sort of get all the extreme overclockers to come together anyway, yeah. and we use that opportunity to leverage for the amateur and say, hey, you know what? You see all the smoke on the side here, that's overclocking, but it's actually very easy, and you can do it at home, and you can do it with your all-in-one cooler, and you can do yeah. it with your air system, and it's really easy. Like I'll Give me 10 minutes and I'll give you 40% performance increase. Plus, it's also a chance for the, the new guys that will be to, to meet the, 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 the guys that are more experienced. Eventually, sure, yeah. you're like, hey, what team are you in? Oh, you have no team. Hey, you should join us. That will be a, that's a good occasion to maybe recruit some, some, some fresh blood as well for some of the communities. Some, uh, so I, I suppose a lot of over, like overclocking has a very has an image right now where it, it looks like it's one. It's very expensive, very corporate and very, uh, very, very technical. And it's, that's not really what overclocking is. It's actually very easy, it's very safe, <laughs> and it's, it's, you, it, it's, it's very It's become very easy and very safe, yeah. yeah. So, it's a very good way to, to train your, uh, your work, so, uh, your problem solving skills as well. Because I would say 70% of overclocking is troubleshooting. Yeah, yeah, you spend more time finding, trying to find It's more fun than Sudokus. <laughs> It's a little bit like <laughs> fishing also at some point. <laughs> With yeah, it's kind of like getting your FN2 plus AMD to run at 6 gigahertz, right? <laughs> I think you did a video on that. Uh, yeah, I think Truth did, well, did that one. Well, no, I think Peter did that one. I did one? He's like, I'm going to show you how to clock to 6 gigahertz on your AMD Trinity. And you went into the BIOS and changed some stuff and then hit enter and rebooted and it didn't boot. And you're like, <laughs> go, 6 gigahertz. Uh, yeah, that yeah. Oh, I that was with the XTU video, I think. I did one with XTU. It was to, to show there was no risk. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Just go full <laughs> retard on the slider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just go to max. They would see nothing will happen. Like Indeed, even, nothing happens. <laughs> I, 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 see some, I see some comments in the, in, the, in the chat as well. It says it's, it's easy, but it's expensive. It's not supposed to be... It, it's not <laughs> always expensive. It's just that right now... Should I dig into this? It's like I don't want to. I don't want to offend um, Intel too much because they make they make good products, but they sort of lack um, well, cheap they, they, overclockable CPUs. Yeah. The K one, uh, like for example, G thirty two fifty eight, is the only very cheap chip. Yeah, but that's not even a K CPU. Yeah, it's not a K. -1. It's an anniversary edition. It's a special. So that's thing. that's the that's the key problem. And if you look back five years five five years ago, you had a Core i five seven fifty for $200, yeah. which was very, very popular. And you had the Pentium E2160 at about 50 US dollars, which was very popular as well. So you had actually people who could who could experience what overclocking is and how much performance yeah. gain you can get. It, without putting 300 US. Yeah, without putting down 250 US dollar, yeah. 300 US dollar for, for an i5 right now. And we did some, we did some re research on it as well. If you look below the $200 category, the most popular overclocking CPU is the Pentium K yeah. at $72. So anything between Pentium and the Core i5, anyone who has a budget for a CPU between that, that price point, who is willing to pay more than 100, but not willing to pay more than, than, than 200, there's nothing yeah. there except for a, a 
you know, a cut down version of Haswell with two cores, not even hyper threading. Yeah, yeah, not very useful. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you can always go to your Raspberry Pi. And, there's, you know, there's those a, are very cheap as well, but they are not Intel cheap. <laughs> to be fair, all of AMD's offerings are overclockable. Oh yeah. I just want to say that. I want to put that out there. Say that. It's a bit more of a pain sometimes with the drivers, but <laughs> AMD's CPUs are pretty fun actually. Yeah. Actually, that there's, um, there's probably there would be there would be good room to do overclocking stuff with say, AMD chips, definitely like competitions or small contests. Yeah. But then again, motivating the the this is the what Intel I, convinced crowd to move to. <laughs> this is what I'm like ag again AMD. Come on, you can do better than doing nothing with your overclock. You can't just don't say hey you can't overclock it. Do something with it. You have this entire lineup of CPUs where yeah. all of them are overclocked. Do something with that. The marketing just says, it's unlocked, it's unlocked. I don't That's know. It. I don't know. It's strange. <laughs> it's strange. I mean, between between seventy do, $72 and was it 250 US dollars, there's a space and type. All the, uh, anyone who wants to tune with their PC can go in there and get an AMD CPU and they'll be able to, to fine tune it and, and play around with it. And, you know, but, uh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a question from... Uh, Avatar and Pandora about some, so overclocking is i5 4690K and asking about temperature, how much would be too hot, how much, what would be to expect in terms of temperature. So I guess that always depends if you're benching with air cooling, uh, AC, air cooling, water cooling, really depends. But I guess usually like too hot is usually above 90 for too long. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that the question about how, how hot is too hot is, um, it's sort of a skewed question because it usually comes down to what your personal preference is. That's some what people are gonna do, right? Well, some people feel very uncomfortable running over seventy degrees centigrade, and they have a custom water cooling specifically for that. Yeah. But then other people are okay. You know what? If I run eighty-five degree all day, that's fine as well. The in Intel CPUs have all these protections set in place that even if you go over a hundred degrees, it would just clock itself down yeah, to protect itself from, down, yeah. from dying. Like overheating, overheating, killing your CPU. I haven't seen anyone do that i mean even Since if ages you, honestly the last time it happened for me was pendulum one i forgot to plug the fan even even if you try <laughs> even if you try to kill your cpu it's it's already pretty difficult yeah yeah it just shuts down and so let's say as a general rule of thumb try to keep it below 80 degrees centigrade stressed yeah. don't go crazy if it goes to 85 degrees um Definitely keep it below 90 now, because otherwise you. Yeah. The, the, the problem is not of breaking it; it's just that if you go over 90, you're in that in that zone where the CPU might throttle down and you lose performance. Yeah. So there's no point in be to be in that zone. Yeah, and at that point, you just have to upgrade a bit, uh, get a better water cooling. Go water like cooling, that. yes. Yeah, we even saw some guys with the you know water cooling with a bucket of ice and water. That's a first step towards extreme. <laughs> oh yeah. So yeah. Any more questions? Since we're at the question section. Yeah, anyway. go ahead, guys, if you have any questions. I saw Sir Dai Latsuzuru uh, writing a whole bunch. What would you suggest for somebody that wants to get into overclock uh, to read, to learn the basics and how to make, not make costly mistakes? Uh, those are my specs. Uh, Rampage 5 Extreme, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so you have some good specs, actually, to, to begin with. I guess you shouldn't have no problem to, to bench. I don't know what CPU you have, though. It's a Rampage 5 Extreme, so, so that's already be, yeah. um, that's above a, uh, a low budget for someone to start overclocking. There's a couple of ways to get involved. Uh, first and foremost, I would always recommend to join a forum because yeah. on the forum you'll get the best advice. Even though even if you're even though you might just want to learn from Facebook and start following overclockers, join forums because there's there's always people willing to help out help help you out with troubleshooting your problem. Well, plus it helps other, right? Yeah. On Facebook, it only helps the friends of the friends. So. Secondly, um, you might want to consider joining an overclocking competition like the Rookie Rumble. Those are competitions usually only with air cooling and maybe maybe you're not going to win, but it'll give you some good pointers on yeah. where you want to push. Who's the guy up, up from you? And yeah, so let's say, you have, let's say you have 1,200 points and you see the guys above you, 12, 12, 10, it might help you like, okay, I'm going to try a little bit higher. And yeah. it, it's just a very fun way to figure out what your system is capable of. Um, yeah. ap apart from that, read guides. Um, use, the, use the overclocking software provided by, in this case, in this case, ASUS. Yeah. Um, Use XTU. You can use that as well. Yeah, as a as a comparison tool, or just as a 
basic overclocking tool itself. As a, as a, as a, as a rule of thumb, um, when you start overclocking, just look at what your CPU is running at yeah. default and um, f uh, set the voltage to, to, to the default as well, like 1.1 volt, and then increase the CPU multiplier. If you run into instability issues, just increase the voltage a little bit and increase the multiplier again. And if you don't know what your stock voltage is, you can always look it up in CPU Z. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Before you start moving stuff. <laughs> but yeah. So, um, any other question, guys? Go ahead. Um, on our side, um, what's going to be next in terms of uh, OC show and things here in the studio? What's the what's next? Uh, videos. Videos. More videos. Yeah. So we are saying because we have this nice studio here, which is almost soundproof. It's still a little bit of echo, right? Can you hear an echo, Dennis? Or the chat? Hey, chat. Do you hear echo? It's a little echo, I think. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't hear an echo. You guys sound actually pretty good right now. Okay. Well, so it's just us, maybe. Then. Maybe it's too low that the microphone doesn't fix it up. So it's a mm -hmm. it's a good sign. You sound yep. very good as well, Dennis. Yeah. Oh well, thank you. I'm I'm uh, talking on my Logitech webcam. Thank you. Now, microphone the, for Logitech webcam. Yeah, it's not terrible. Um, as Peter knows, it's not, it's not I, terrible. That's a great <laughs> recommendation. Not it's terrible. Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, as Peter knows, I have uh, considerably better gear for the podcast. Although I record in the garage, which has absolutely no soundproofing at all, so yeah. But uh, you have a podcast microphone, so it helps a lot, I guess. We just have yep. a regular mic. That would be the next big investment: some boom mics. <laughs> Funny story, because we actually found out that the the gear of uh, of Dennis is very coughing proof as well. <laughs> is it? <laughs> so some of that is. It the sound. <laughs> it's too loud. <laughs> oh, I I visited Dennis. Uh, was it last? Not last year, but the year before yeah. that, and I had a terrible cough. But he wanted to do an interview anyway. So during the interview, we had to, at several points, <laughs> just cut it, and then I needed to cuff everything out, and then get me some fresh water. <laughs> start again. But actually, the the sound turned out to be pretty pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that was some creative editing on my part. So. Mm -hmm. Good. But yeah, it was a. Uh, it turned out really good, and believe it or not, that's one of the more popular past episodes that gets downloaded. Hey, so by so. the way, talking about episode, when is your next one? What will be the topic? Let's see. There is a. Uh, there was two of them that got released just this last week. Uh, both about Computex. Um, the first one was the main show where we talked about video cards, and motherboards, and stuff like that. And then Darren, well, we talked for like an hour and a half. And then when Darren did his uh, creative cutting, he created an extra out of the uh, the parts that he didn't think would make it into the main show. So that got launched today. The uh, next one will be kind of about um, you know some travel stuff, and then a new section on Hardware Asylum called Builds. Build guides. Yep. Yeah. So we're going to be building systems for people now. Cool. Or, good. Yeah. I guess there's always a market for building systems. That's great. Well, it's what is it is it making a build guide as a recommendation or actually building a PC for someone who needed a PC? It's mostly for recommendations, okay. um, but I'm taking a different approach to that. There'll be you know the general run of the mill sort of systems for your grandma, uh, gaming rigs which kind of have an elevated uh, price ceiling, so it'll be realistic sort of gaming rigs instead of these two hundred dollar machines that some sites do. Um, and then there's going to be an unlimited category where I'm going to be building some uh, some systems based off of like uh, LN2 overclocking, for instance, or maybe we want to do um, PCI Express RAID, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So the uh, the first one that I have planned that we talked about in the podcast will be a four-way SLI LN2 overclocking rig. So I'll have containers, I'll have video cards, motherboards, CPUs. That's already not some small starter rig. That's some pretty impressive. No, rig. that's like, that's like going to be the. Is that you know, your is that is that your grandmother run of the mill gaming system? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. This is how you start overclocking. <laughs> Go straight away, four way puts everything. So what puts yep. are you gonna use for those bits? I'm not sure yet. Yeah. So I mean, there's basically it. two different companies I can pick from, right? Whether you there's go American or you go German, eh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it'll depend, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe which, um, it'll depend on who has the cheapest price or most availability or something, I don't know. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, 
So there's a Nigerian tuning in asking, where are you now? Just got in. So we're actually just about to wrap up. Actually, we're asking Dennis about his uh, upcoming podcast and previous ones. So tune in earlier. Yeah, uh, the replay will be on YouTube, guys, in a few minutes. The time we upload this and it gets processed. But thank you for tuning in anyway. <laughs> And um, if you have some more questions, uh, feel free to just uh, shoot them through or post them on the Facebook page or Twitter and we we'll just try to reply it next time. So like Peter was saying before, before we were into that room thing and talking about the sum and the reverb. So we're gonna plan, we were, we're planning to do more videos, more overclocking guides, more maybe even some live action overclocking stuff. So like basically uh, the whole benching session from beginning to the end. So you guys can follow what's going on and how to do it yourself eventually, if you want. And uh, that would be a great occasion to ask more questions as well, I guess. Um, Actually, yeah. Um, if the chat could let us know what kind of overclocking demonstrations they would like to see, that would yeah. be that would be what cool. type of system, yeah, what type cooling, of air cooling, well. all in one, whatever. We've got pretty much everything. We even have some L2 still left. But Ob Obscure Paradox had a seri serious question above. So let me scroll up. Oh yes. At HW.team, uh, with regards to Geekbench, have you guys tested it on Windows 7? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. I only <laughs> ask <laughs> because I know uh, it has its own clock timer, but in which it triggered an overclocked Intel system before. Off topic, but important, all at the same. Oh, um, I, th I think for the specifics, it's best to ask Christian and, uh, and Geneva. Yeah, those they are the head moderators at HW. Yeah, they look at this kind, of, uh, this kind of problems. Hello, hands. <laughs> Uh, want to hear what the overclocking <laughs> community says about Fury X and the HBM memory? I'm sure there's a topic somewhere on the HL about forums about it. Oh, so what do you hear what the overclocking is? Oh, uh, well, yeah, well, uh, plus we talked about it actually uh, yeah. a few points ago, so you're gonna have to watch the replay for that. We, we covered that before, we're uh, already uh, an hour uh, in, it's uh, about time we, we wrap up. Yeah. So next episode, uh, we'll be shooting that um, not next week, the week after. So that's going to be in uh, two weeks. Hopefully this time we'll shoot it on Monday so we can air it on Wednesday before it's uh, too late for the show. <laughs> this week, sorry, guys, it was a little bit uh, late on Friday this weekend. Uh, thanks, Dennis, for being part of the show again. It was a great pleasure to have you on board as usual. Uh, guys, yeah. if you want to listen to some cool podcasts, go to hardwareasylum.com. Uh, .com, right? And there you have yeah. a cool podcast, some upcoming uh, build guides by Dennis. With so, four-way SLI on it yeah. for your grandmother. And listen to his <laughs> previous podcast about Computex, and there's some cool stuff in there. I haven't listened to it yet, but it's always cool, so I can guarantee you it wouldn't be nice. Thanks, Peter, <laughs> for being here and filling in for Truthman. I guess we can fire Truthman now, and we can just keep on going without him. I don't know. I think we need to have a poll. Who is the coolest, <laughs> Truthman or I? I love your little dinosaur in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so thanks very much guys thanks for tuning in and um, peace out I would say yeah. if that's what we can say right? <laughs> until the next time until the next time take care guys <laughs>